Hey, this is Carlos Cavallo. Welcome back to the video. And this week, we're talking about something pretty cool. I'm going to talk to you about crossing the gender divider for a minute to come over to the guy's side. I'm going to talk to you, well, not only about what women, what men want in a woman, but we're also going to talk about what we worry about. All right. I want to talk to you about what it's like for guys on the other side of the fence and how we think and, you know, what's going through our crazy little heads. Because I'm sure that's something that maybe you're curious about just a little bit. You're probably wondering what is going through that meaty little head of his and why are guys so confusing. But the reality is he's really not that confusing if you know how we pretty much think on a simple basis. Now, I know that uh, many women look for a lot more meaning behind something than may actually be there. Okay, it's just one of those common things. It's a, it's one of the things that social anthropologists have figured out about one of the key differences between men and women. And it's not a bad thing. It's actually very good because women are looking for more meaning behind the words. Now, the reason for this and the reason that, well, guys are kind of acclimated to this is because, well, women were cultured or brought up differently, right? Women are brought up with the girls that they socialize with and the, uh, the directness factor is what I call it. Because women can't be as direct with each other. It's not looked on as a positive thing. It's not a rewarded trait. When you're a kid, if you're too direct, well, you're thought of as being kind of the difficult girl or the bitchy girl or the one that stands out. And that is not a desirable trait in a woman. Being upfront and direct wouldn't go well with other girls that you hung out with, so you had to be a smooth talker. You had to be socially savvy, smooth out, kind of smooth out those wrinkles and stay political in your dealings with other girls. And as a result, what happened was you knew that other girls were hiding things under their words because you were doing it, right? They rarely said exactly what they meant, and you had to be very careful about how you pried information out. They weren't going to give up all the goods. Now, what this means to most women is that you grew up thinking that everybody is like that. That means that you think that guys do the same thing, that we're somehow hiding a lot of information behind our words. Well, oftentimes it's not, but sometimes we are. You know, sometimes we don't want to hurt your feelings. And that's pretty much the only time when we don't say exactly what we're thinking and feeling. Most of the time, we are saying exactly what we mean because guys are rewarded for being very direct and not rewarded for being indirect. And that's a primary drive for guys. You know, we want to make you happy. So we might not be as direct sometimes, and sometimes we kind of white lie our way through a situation, but it's not something you need to worry about because once a guy is in the relationship with you, generally speaking, We'll tell you exactly what we're thinking. Now, one of the things that you might not know, because we don't talk about it on the first date, we'll talk about it later, are some of the things that freak us out. They freak us out when we're dating, and it throws us for a loop. And this is good information for you to know, because you're going to be aware of what some of our sore spots are. Now, first thing she, that we're worried about is, what if she's not impressed with me? You know, what if she's uh, not impressed with who I am? Maybe I should show off a little bit, show some pictures of my karate championship trophies or stuff, stuff like that. You know, we don't want to disappoint women, and we don't even know necessarily what it is you even like about us. We wonder how to play ourselves up, and we worry, what if, honestly, on a, on a level, what if we're just not enough for you to make you interested? What if you don't find us interesting enough to be sexually attracted to? It's a very big concern for us. Another worry is we worry about the conversation before, during, and after the date. You know, what if my bet, my, what if the best joke I've got that I tell you doesn't really get you to laugh? There's nothing worse for us than the thought of that pregnant pause or the uncomfortable silence after somebody tells a joke and she doesn't find it all that funny. That's pretty one. That's pretty much one of the most traumatic things I can think of on a date. We don't want to experience that, and he's still got to try though. So he's got that fear running through his head. What about uh, the fear of being stood up? Yeah, that's a huge one for guys. I know it's big for women. We definitely do not want to be sitting at a restaurant petrified about making eye contact with anybody, including our waiter, because we got stood up. She didn't show up for the date, and then we got to try and play it off like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I didn't think she was going to show up anyway, so that's why I brought this book. That's a big one for us. Getting stood up is awful for a guy. And, of course, it's awful for women too. What about talk about the ex? Yikes. We don't want that coming up. What if I accidentally talk about my ex-girlfriend? Or what if she talks about her ex-boyfriend? Or what if one of them actually shows up at the restaurant? Ah, there's nothing worse than having nothing to talk about, but actually worse than that is having to hear or talk about the ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend that she, or your ex-boyfriend that you're clearly not gotten over yet. And that tells us right off the bat what? We're not getting anywhere, and this date is basically a therapy session. We also fear 
if we take you to a restaurant and it might turn out to be a little more expensive than we expect but we want to impress you but we might not be able to afford it because we're still on a budget and we're still at that starting part in our careers you know uh, maybe you order the lobster or on Yelp it's one of those five dollar sign restaurants and we feel our wallet emptying you know we fully intend to pick up the check but you know what not every guy's made of money and if he's out there on the dating scene he's got to be a little cost conscious I mean, he's not intending to be cheap, but he's got to keep in mind he's also got to be able to afford his own life, his own hobbies, his own bills, and in order for him to court women, most of which he may never see again and probably won't, he's also got to spend money on that. So we get used to that as guys. We get used to the math that for every 10 dates or so, who knows, maybe one of those turns into a, a sleepover or at least a short-term girlfriend. But those are dates we've got to spend upwards of $75 or more depending on the restaurant we go to. Then we worry about the drinking. Oh my God, how much should we drink? Should we drink a little? Should we drink a lot? How much is enough? How much is enough to make it socially lubricated and interesting enough for you? Should we match whatever you're drinking because you're probably going to be nervous too? Could we get so drunk that the date is actually no longer awkward? What if we have to run off and puke? What if we get so drunk that we're going to do a one-night stand that neither one of us remembers? Yeah, that's the drinking situation. Then we got to worry about the condom. Oh yeah, guy's got to carry a condom, right? Because it's his responsibility, even though, yes, more and more today, women do carry their own protection with them. But guys don't want to look too cocky, forgive the pun, or that he's being presumptuous if he flashes you his tro Trojan rib for your pleasure sticking out of his wallet. But we also don't want to be without one. So just in case, we got to be careful about showing that telltale ring silhouette that says, hey, I might get lucky. There's the first kiss, you know. Do we get that kiss? Do we go for the kiss? Why should we go for the kiss? Should I do it? I don't know if I should do it. What if he's not the kind of the kisses on the first date? That's crazy and neurotic too. Then it haunts us. How do we look? You know, do I did I dress myself up correctly here? Does it look like my mom did this? What does this shirt say about me as a person? Now it's a crazy thing we have to worry about, but of course women can relate to that one too. We actually have to try and think about what women interpret things about, which we have no clue, because we do know that women look at our appearance with a lot of scrutiny. We do our best, but we probably never do well enough, but we try. Another thing we worry about is, what is the best way to ask someone out without sounding like a creepy stalker dude? Or on the other hand, sound like we don't care that much, so we don't sound too needy. We don't want to sound impassionate, so how do we walk that line? When we find somebody that we're totally into, asking her out is a whole new question because we don't want to risk that rejection. It's really a huge, huge thing with guys. Rejection is a killer. It's a killer of confidence, and we have to figure out you know, how soon do we ask you out? How long do we wait? Do we avoid saying something for sometimes years like some guys do? Or do we ask her right away? Do we get her phone number, and then do we text her a lot, and then try to build a connection? It's crazy, but this is a lot of the stuff that we do worry about. What about another date? What about just getting another date with you? You know, we got to worry about whether or not uh, we're going to actually be compatible enough to get another date. I mean, there's this kind of twisted relief that men feel, and sometimes women feel this too, I'm sure, when we get to that moment on a date and we get to leave the date. You know, it's like a, we walk back, we get to walk back home or walk back to our car and realize, oh God, thank God, it's over. And sometimes, this is even more neurotic, by the way, we know we're never going to see each other again and... Uh, it actually feels good. Even when we liked you, even when a guy likes you and we know we're never going to see you again, it feels good because it feels like we just got off a roller coaster and we can finally relax. It might have been a little touch and go there for a while, but we survived and we're out of that now. It is. It's a crazy thing. And then there's another worry. We worry. Um, what we worry about most is the prospect that the date goes well. And that means we've got to ask for a second date and we got to do this whole thing all over again. What if you get another date and all these things happen again? You see how that mental stress kind of compounds for a guy? It's mixed up and messed up and it makes our dating life, I wouldn't say miserable, but it definitely makes it much more neurotic and anxiety ridden than it needs to be. Now, if you got something out of this, and I hope you did, I want you to get the full story. I want you to get the full understanding of what makes a man commit to you and what makes a man want to stay in there for the long haul and keep coming back for more dates and keep coming back and keep coming back so that you have a chance to get this thing off the ground. Go on over to www.datingadviceguru.com slash forever. Datingadviceguru.com slash forever where I'll teach you the principles of how to make a man forever yours with a very interesting twist. I want you to watch my presentation there because 
it will wake you up to some very, very important things about how to make men want to stay with you for the long haul. Go on over there to datingadviceguru.com slash forever. And I'll be talking again soon. This is Carlos Cavallo.